Welcome to the Art of Precision on Gillette World Sport. Today we're in review mode talking penalties with Neymar Jr. Getting a lesson in basketball biomechanics. And we're back in the pool with Olympic champion Mac Horton. It's all about the precision, especially when you're looking for the very small gains. We start our final show of the year by revisiting Neymar Jr. to look back at some of the Brazilians' standout winning penalties. A record-breaking transfer earlier in 2017 saw Brazilian football prodigy Neymar Jr. become the most expensive player in the world at 222 million euros. Having moved from Barcelona FC to Paris Saint-Germain, the striker reflected on some of his career highlights so far. I've experienced two moments in my professional life, two penalties which I think were the most important in my career so far. One was during the Champions League playing against Paris because at that point I had to score in order for our team to have any chance of qualifying and it was in the last minute of the game. I remember picking up the ball and putting it down on the spot and I heard the announcement that there was going to be five minutes of extra time so I thought to myself, I have to score this goal. There are no two ways about it. So I kept myself focused. I felt very confident, very calm, and very relaxed, ready to take that penalty. And thank God, I scored. The other one was in the 2016 Olympic final, and that one was different. Even the walk up to the ball was agony. I think that walk is actually harder than taking the penalty. Because when you walk up and look at the goal, it feels far away. It looks small and the goalkeeper looks big. So much goes through your head. And then when you put the ball on the spot and look at the goal, you feel more relaxed because you know you've trained for that moment. You have to be prepared. Time now to continue our look through the social highlights of 2017. Floyd Mayweather took on Conor McGregor in one of the most lucrative boxing matches in history. Undefeated Mayweather stopped the UFC lightweight champion in the 10th round, taking home over $100 million in the process. World number one Rafael Nadal posted this message after winning his 16th Grand Slam at the US Open. Yeah, uh, difficult to describe the feeling. European Rugby Champions Cup winners Saracens called off in the sun with this elaborate poolside routine. Neymar Jr. played an improvised game of table tennis with his Brazilian teammates after his 2017 transfer made him the most expensive footballer in history. Paul Pogba used to hold that title and the French midfielder also proved he's a pretty good basketball player, hitting this shot against NBA star Joel Embiid. <laughs> Seven-time X Games champion Mark McMorris was back on the slopes after recovering from a number of serious injuries in a fall at the start of the year. Golfer Jordan Spieth toasted success after he won the Open Championship at Royal Birkdale. How's it taste? Fantastic. And finally, after saying goodbye to the track at the end of the 2017 World Athletics Championships, Usain Bolt jumped into the passenger seat to take a spin with Formula One champion Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> Next, we caught up with Olympic champion Mac Horton in Australia as he prepared for the 2017 Swimming World Championships. I love everything about swimming. I love the challenge. I love the training. The training's like my favorite part. I love to just get up and grind and then, you know, be done by 7, 8 in the morning and still have a full day ahead of me knowing that I've done all this work. 
To be a good swimmer, you need the work ethic and to be willing to put in what you need to to be able to get to where you want to. But the distance freestyle specifically, you probably need that even more so because you do so many Ks and spend so much time in the water. And then in a physical sense, I guess you need the longer arms and the big long torso as well. So I think my arms are two meters and seven centimeters and my body is 190. Most swimmers these days have body shapes like that, but it definitely helps in long distance freestyle because the longer your stroke is, the less strokes you have to do, so the easier it ends up being. I think Max's success in his freestyle comes from the fact that he's, he's probably one of the most efficient swimmers in the water. The beginning of that was there when he was a very young swimmer. So at an early age, you could see he had that long, languid stroke. It was more about tailoring it and teaching him how to use that to great effect. So a lot of the work we did early on was uh, based around stroke efficiency and being able to swim and sustain speed at a very efficient stroke. And then with the idea that later on we could increase the stroke rate and improve his stroke rate so that he, he could improve as a swimmer. From a young age, I got into the habit of counting my strokes every single lap and just trying to get it lower and lower and lower. So now I sit at probably about 28 strokes a lap without even thinking about it. And even in a 1500 race, I set it 28 strokes a lap, which means I'm burning less energy, but also I'm a bit more powerful. And then when I pick up my stroke rating, I can travel further and faster. Based at the Victorian Institute of Sport, Horton combines pool sessions with physical dry land training in a regime that gradually builds over four years, aiming for the next Olympic Games. Going into Rio, I was doing 10 pool sessions a week, so most days that's double pool sessions, one at 5.30 in the morning and one at 3 in the afternoon. Two gym sessions as well, so they're big days. I do boxing as well, and then there's all the physio and massage and the stretching and whatever to keep my body going. It's really important to break the stroke down and vary what you do during sessions to keep it interesting, but also to improve individual aspects of your stroke. So, you know, every session you're always trying to work on something different, and each part of the session you're always trying to work on something different. So whether it's my breath or the front end of my stroke or getting a stronger kick or, you know, trying to combine it all together during like a main set at pace, it's always something different. Literally everyone goes about the 1500 or distance swimming in a different way, but a fundamental aspect of distance swimming is being able to just drop the pace when you're ready. Like, it doesn't even have to be at the back end in a 1500, it can be 700 metres or 900 metres or 1100 metres. You just have to be ready to like just drop 100, leave everyone behind and then hold the pace from there. In gym we've been working on strength but then also doing power as well and explosive stuff. So we'll usually leading up to a competition do you know heavy weights and then go straight into something explosive so that you know I am strong but when I need to be explosive for you know the back end of a fifteen hundred or the back end of a four hundred, I also have that power there as well. Leading into Rio. We knew our biggest shift was going to be in the turns, so we were aiming for 0.3 of a second a turn, which is, like, really, it's nothing, but it's a lot in a 1500. When you add it up, it's like a couple of seconds. We went down to minute detail in terms of how we approach these turns, you know, what we were improving on in the water, entry to the turn execution, because through the 400 and the 1500, we knew that was a place that he could be better than his competitors. So it was about trying to get the foot placement on the wall in the right spot, and that's like a matter of centimetres between the right spot and the wrong spot. Trying to get the timing of the fly kicks off the wall correct as well, so that's literally like milliseconds trying to get that right. So yeah, it's all about the precision, especially when you're looking for the very small um, gains. I think now it's obviously looking for those smaller details within his training, within his day-to-day -day recovery from one session to the next. And I think also the fact that we've got four years to play with, we can take a, a step back, refocus, and then you know head towards 2020 again. The goal is always Olympics, so it is a four-year cycle, but there is World Champs in Budapest, Com Games the following year on the Gold Coast, which is a home Games, which is really exciting, and then World Champs the following year as well. So we'll take each benchmark meet each year as a stepping stone to, I guess, kind of lift the intensity until we get closer and closer to Tokyo. Having already won a gold medal in Rio, I'm not sure if there will be pressure. I kind of like the pressure, though. Like, in Rio, I kind of thrived off the pressure, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes.
Welcome back to Gillette World Sport. Coming up, the importance of precision for some of this year's biggest athletes. And how Sebastian Ogier won his fifth World Rally Championship. With the current NBA season now well underway, we're hitting the hard court for another chance to see our intricate lesson in basketball biomechanics. To counteract the state of weightlessness caused by lack of gravitation, special magnetic boots are provided to control the balance of space travelers. Typically, the casual sports fan probably thinks of the guys who can fly, who can jump really well as being the supreme athletes, and there's no question that those guys are incredible athletes. They can do incredibly athletic things. But, you know, there's a, a very important lateral component to NBA athletes and to, you know, playing the game at a very high level. If I were to define athleticism or redefine athleticism, I would start in two places. First, I think there has to be a lateral component in conjunction to a vertical component. These sports are not played in a vacuum, right? They're played in multiple planes. And then starting to go beyond just raw jump heights or times from a 40-yard dash, something like this, and being able to see these kind of smaller picture biomechanical metrics in the extension velocities and hip extension velocities and hip abduction, these metrics may be ultimately more predictive of you know, what occurs on the court or on the field than you know, just the raw, raw output. When we talk about you know, guys testing at the NBA Combine, the first thing you always hear is how you know, the guys who jump 40 inches, right? the guys who jumped incredibly well, guys who win dunk contests. right? It's, it's very catchy. It's awesome. It's very easy to see. But you know, that's just a piece of the puzzle. Sports science and data help to explain why traditional metrics can't always predict a player's true skill level and athleticism and give valuable insights into why players such as the Houston Rockets' James Harden are able to play at an elite level. James is an interesting case, right, where, you know, by your traditional combine metrics, just jump heights, he wouldn't necessarily stand out for an NBA point guard. He jumps maybe about average for a guy in his position, but he wouldn't stand out in any way. He's not considered, you know, an elite athlete. But from looking at some of his more, I guess, undercover, behind-the-scenes kinematics or his biomechanical metrics, what we can see is that he does some things at a very elite level that probably relate more to the way he plays the game than just his raw jump height. So for James, it all takes place very, very early on in the movement. The eccentric phase, or kind of the loading phase, he's able to unweight himself very effectively, a quality of our best jumpers. So he's able to really kind of relax and load the, the musculature that's very involved in ultimately changing direction or creating a lot of force. And then he's able to generate a ton of eccentric force, right? We call it peak eccentric force, 98th percentile among all athletes we've tested in the NBA. Um, and that allows him to really just stop on a dime, right? So when you see him being very shifty with the ball in his hand, change direction, that's really where that, that quality comes from for him. It's a, it's a very rare attribute, and he uses it very well. Another aspect of athleticism is lateral movement or sideways movement, the crucial component for defending at a high level in basketball. I've had the, you know, the pleasure of working with Matthew Del Vadova, point guard for the Milwaukee Bucks, for uh, the past few years. The question with him coming out of college was always, athletically, how could he compete on the NBA level? After going through some tests with him, he does some things very, very effectively on an NBA scale, particularly when it comes to lateral movement. He's a dynamic lateral athlete, and I think over the course of his career, that's laid out in some of his strengths, particularly on the defensive end. He's, he's a pest, right? And he has the physical systems on board that allow him to be a very dynamic lateral plane mover. If you think about playing defense, it's entirely lateral movement. Being able to maintain effective biomechanics over the course of 24 seconds is very difficult to do. I've seen a, you know, a very subset of our NBA population, particularly on the guard level, who can move laterally with incredible efficiency, and they've been able to carve out nice careers because of it. NBA teams are spreading the floor with three-point shooters more than at any time in history, forcing traditional big men such as Detroit Pistons center Andre Drummond to cover more of the court when defending. Andre is rare in the sense that he's 6'10", he's huge, he's a monster, but he's able to move in many ways like an NBA guard. Now, you combine guard movement qualities with a guy who's as big as he is, and you're dealing with a mismatch night in and night out, and that's why he's been able to be so effective the last couple of years. He really hits some pretty critical markers for us, moving both vertically and laterally. The way he's able to, to utilize his hips to create force is pretty rare for an athlete of his size, but even more generally an athlete in the NBA period. Vertically as well, Andre, he can fly, he can jump exceedingly high. But he's also able to jump in many different environments. So we, you know, we have a test where it's less about how high you can jump and more about how quickly you can jump. And we put all of our big men through it, and Andre is one of the fastest guys we've ever tested on this. He's able to jump or get to a spot very, very quickly, which, you know, when you're fighting for rebounds, is a very important quality. He's just, he's a freak. There's no, there's no two ways about it.
Now we back up to the beginning of the season for a roundup of this year's World Rally Championship. Described as the most keenly anticipated season to date, the World Rally Championship 2017 saw four-time world champion Sebastian Auger get off to a flying start at the wheel of his new drive with private British outfit M Sport by claiming his fourth victory in Monte Carlo and M Sport's first win in five years. There was another historic result at round two in Sweden as Yari Matti Latvala flew through the weekend to take Toyota's first victory in 18 years. After Citroën's Chris Meek came top in Mexico, Neuville won the fourth round in France, so Ogier would need to react at Rally Argentina, but his day got off to a bad start thanks to an incorrect pace note, meaning he went too fast into a slow corner. Although he recovered, Neuville was attacking each stage and eventually took his second win in a row, pushing Ogier off the podium and closing the gap in the overall standings. But Auger clawed back the lead at the next stop in Portugal, cruising to his second victory of the season and opening up the points gap once again. The series leader led off at the seventh round in Sardinia, but it was teammate Oitanak who brought his Ford Fiesta safely home for a maiden WRC triumph six years after he first joined M Sport. Auger was just 18 points ahead at round eight in Poland, but rival Thierry Neuville was comfortably in the lead and cruised to victory, reducing Auger's championship lead to just 11 points. All eyes were there for on the race for the driver's title at round nine in Finland, but early in the rally, Auger lost control of the car completely and hit a tree, which left his co-driver Julian Ingrazia concussed, ending their race weekend early. Thierry Neuville had the perfect opportunity to claim back points, but struggled in his Hyundai and could only manage sixth place. Not enough to take the overall lead, but it meant the two rivals were now on level points at 160 each. Under dark clouds in Germany, Thierry Neuville was first on the road, but hot on his heels was joint leader Sebastian Ogier. Despite a quick recovery, a slight oversteer on an early corner handed the advantage to his Belgian rival. On stage three, however, Nerville misread the grip on the road, with a fan capturing his lucky escape, which now put him behind Ogier. Nerville's weekend only worsened on Saturday, as a shallow curb broke the suspension on his Hyundai. With his car leaving a trail of smoke, the Belgian calculated the damage to his title bid. In contrast, Ogier resisted the need to push for the win, a third-place finish giving him a 17-point advantage whilst teammate Oit Tanak brought his Fiesta safely home to strengthen M Sport's bid for the team crown. Rally Spain saw Chris Meek comfortably leading with Ogier, Nerville and Tanak trading places on every stage in a thrilling battle for second. Ogier eventually powered through to claim the runner-up spot by five seconds and once again expand his comfort zone at the top of the championship leaderboard. At the penultimate round in Wales, Nerville was pushing hard, but steering problems saw his Hyundai veering off into a ditch, starting an unfortunate weekend which finally put an end to his title bid. M Sport, however, had more than one reason to celebrate. Welshman Elfin Evans crossed the line to take his first ever win. The team's overall success secured the manufacturer's championship. And finally, Sebastian Auger also sealed the deal with two extra points from the power stage, taking him to an unassailable lead at 32 points, meaning he was crowned driver's champion for a fifth time with a round to spare. Finally, we revisit some of the athletes featured on the show this year to discover how important precision has been to their success. Position. It's all about getting it right, getting the technique right, the, the acceleration at the right time in, in the transition. You have to get everything perfect for that right race so you can run 9.58. Precision is probably one of the biggest things in Kudus Alm that's kind of underrated. Being really precise on those gates around the pole and keeping those margins down as small as possible keeps you on the optimal line. Ultimately, the shortest distance down the course is going to be the winner. Precision is very important to an AFL player, so when we get the ball, we can pass it on to our teammates and precision in front of goals, so when we get the opportunity to kick a goal and win a game, then we can do that and hopefully get a good score on the board. Precision is essential for off-road running. It's essential to be precise where you put your feet and hold your body uh, when you're running off-road on uneven trails and different surfaces. Precision is important in BMX because You've got to always be on point with where you're either going to land or kind of get back into a certain part of the ramp. 
Precision is very important to me because a diver needs to make sure every detail in a dive is done to the highest level possible. Precision is really important in enduro because the terrain varies that much and sometimes you're going through woods with a few inches on either side of your bike so uh, you need to know exactly where your front wheel is, where your rear wheel is. Precision, I think, is everything in football. When you've got the ball, for example, and you want to pass cleanly and directly to your teammate, I think doing it with precision is essential. Precision is important because in wakeboarding you really need to have the precision of your moves because everyone's doing similar moves and the better you are doing them, the more points you're going to get in the contest. Skate across is all about precision. The slightest mishap can cost you the race, so it's all about precision. Precision is absolutely important in breaststroke. You've got to be precise with your timing, with your technique, with your movement. Precision is very important when you're taking shots at the goal. You've got to try and be as precise as possible. The same goes when I'm looking to set up my strike partners, whether with through balls or long passes. Precision is really important in skiing because like, if you go too big or too small, you're really going to get hurt, and so you better be on point. You have to be super precise with your kite. If you make the wrong movement, if you uh, fumble the bar in a, in a bad way, it could cost you the race. 